Ephesians 2, starting at verse 19. That's enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. This kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. God is using us all, irrespective of how we got here and what God is building. God used the apostles and prophets for the foundation, and now God's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. I want to explore this theme, God is building a home. There are many in the African-American community who don't like the Apostle Paul largely because he teaches in Ephesians 6, slaves obey your master as you obey Christ. And in this moment in history, I think it's important uh, to recognize that, first of all, the slavery of ancient Palestine, the slavery of Rome, was not the same chattel slavery that the U.S. Um, endured for over 400 years. But we also know that the slave owners in the United States use these sacred texts to justify slavery. And they use the story of uh, Noah being left unclothed in his tent um, by his grandson Canaan as a basis for what they called the curse of Ham. Uh, This holy text has been used to defile and devalue and dehumanize people of African descent and indeed all brown and black people for centuries. The power of this text for me, particularly in this moment, is that Paul says we all, have a place in this home that God is building using our very unique and diverse creation to build it brick by brick, stone by stone. You know, of course, of the historic um, arguments between Peter and Paul about whether the gospel news of Jesus Christ was intended only for uh, the Jewish people or whether Paul was right in Uh, He uses the word graft, which I'm not sure uh, how I think about that particular language. But um, Paul's notion is that this good news is for everyone and that there is no hierarchy of privilege, even within those who are called the redeemed of God, those who have uh, become followers of Jesus Christ. For me, everything that we believe about Jesus begins with what we believe about God. So just think about it. What do you believe about God? When I was a little girl growing up in a Baptist church that my grandfather pastored, I learned lots of big words for God. God is omniscient, all-knowing. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. As I grew, I came to understand that what I believed about God was that God was a God of no limits and that God's love knows no limits. I don't know what words you use to describe God what your understanding is. That's all theology really is, is our trying to make sense of what we believe about God, the Holy One. Uh, Jesus commands us or reminds us of the two highest commandments, to love God and to love our neighbors ourselves. And when Jesus says that we are to love one another as Jesus has loved us, we have to understand that Jesus' love knew no bounds, and God's love knows no bounds. It raises the bar from just loving ourselves to loving as Jesus has loved us. That is a higher bar to meet. And so if this is what we believe then about God's love, if you accept this premise that God's love is boundless, that there are no limits on God's love, um, then you also have to accept that we must look at everything with that lens as God would see it. I would argue even if that you, if you accept any limits on God, then God is not God. If you accept any limits on whom God loves, then you have in some way limited God. You have limited God. And guess what? You cannot do that. We simply don't have, I believe, the power to limit God. If God is subject to humanly defined limits, then 
God for me is simply not God. I don't want a God that you can limit. I don't want you to be able to circumscribe the goodness, the radical hospitality, the love, the justice, the truth that is associated with the God in whom I believe and trust. There are no grace lines. There are no boxes that any of us can draw to keep any of us outside God's love and grace. And I just refuse to back down on that point of theology. None of us has the right to construct a theology that limits God by limiting whom God loves or whom God accepts. Now, you might actually want to exclude someone. You might want to draw your own doctrinal lines to limit or curtail access or decide what's good and bad, what's uh, good music or bad music, what people should or should not wear, or who can or can't come to your church or whom God accepts or whom God does not accept. But I'm really glad that you are not God. And quite honestly, you should be glad that I'm not God. Patience is still something I'm working on. So I'm really glad that our limitations cannot and should not limit the understanding and the welcoming of this God whose love knows no bounds, whose possibility knows no bounds. Um, Paul is reminding the Ephesians that they are actually what a part of what God intended. They're not strangers or outsiders. You have as much right to the name Christian as anyone else, he says. And he's clear about why no one can be excluded. He says, I I know that God is building a home, a home where all are welcome, a home where we are not only ex included, but needed. God is using everyone, Paul says in the message, brick by brick, stone by stone. And Jesus is the cornerstone of this home, holding us all together. And the building of this home must include us all in order to be consistent with who God is, a God who knows no limits, no bounds, a God whose love is inclusive, and radically so, a God whose love is simply limitless. Jesus always points us to God. Jesus' mission is to reconcile creation with God. God is our cornerstone. He's our mortar. He is the architect. God is the builder of this home. In recent weeks and months, our world has simply been disrupted beyond any uh, memory that most of us have in our lifetime. As an African-American, I have to say that I have uh, dealt with a wide number of feelings. They uh, range from utter rage, total exhaustion, to angry tears, and just a sense of weariness that once again, our, our country is in a place where we're having to make the argument that all of God's creation is worthy of human dignity and respect. It's important to remember this history of this text being used to dehumanize and devalue people of African descent because our whole society has been built upon it. And yet in this very text, the same person who wrote Slaves Obey Your Masters, and that has been taken out of context, that same person writes you have every right to be included as everyone else. And God is building a home that will require each of us in all of our uniqueness to put it together and actually create a place where God, God's self desires to dwell and be a part. Our mission in the world has to be to transform the world in which we live so that every single human being is included in this wonderful home that we're building, that we use all of our gifts and talents, that no piece is considered inferior or less than. For the only foundation we have is God through Jesus Christ. The only foundation we can have is that love. If we don't start there, if we don't theologically start with an understanding of who God is, that God's love is limitless, that God's love is boundless, and that Jesus invites us to reflect that love in order to demonstrate to the world that we are his disciples, 
We can draw no lines that exclude. We can have no practices or laws that privilege one against the other. We have to rid our society of a notion that somehow there are differences among us that we can ascribe as being deficient and therefore dehumanize and devalue those whom God has made. It's really quite simple and quite fundamental. At the heart of this is a God full of love, from whose love we can never be separated, and because of whose love, we must work for a world where all are not just included, but radically so. Gender, sexual orientation, race, uh, whatever the paradigm of identity is that you use, we must understand that none of us gets to decide whom God includes. None of us gets to assign priority or hierarchy to what God values. For in the moment that we do that, we have limited God and therefore God cannot be God. Not the God that I serve, not the God that I worship, not the Jesus that I follow who seeks to reconcile the world to God. I pray that as you move through your studies that you will always figure out what is it that I believe about God? And if there are any limits that you've drawn, you need to get rid of them because you've constructed a God, not discerned a God. You have created something and not trying to be a reflection of the God of all creation yourself. God bless you, D-Men students. God is building a home and it will take each and every one of us with all of our unique differences and all of our unique gifts to ensure that all will continue to be welcome in this home, and that, in fact, it is a place where God himself would choose to dwell. Amen. God bless you. In this moment, let us uh, prepare to go on our way. I love the blessing that Aaron gives in the book of Numbers. My grandfather always used to give that blessing. And so I will just share my own riff on that particular blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May God lift his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up God's countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.